Stay tuned to meet a man that was abandoned by his mother and adopted by an Adventist couple that changed his life. My name is Yvonne Lewis, and you're watching Urban Report. Welcome to Urban Report. Today you're going to meet a man that actually embodies our Dare to Dream philosophy that God's got a divine plan for all of us. Let's welcome Pastor Moses Brown to Urban Report and hear his story. Welcome, Pastor Brown. So good to see you, Dr. Lewis. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Praise the Lord. Great to see you too. How are you? God has been so good. I'm just too blessed to be stressed. Amen. Amen. God is so good. So let's talk a bit about your journey because you have such an interesting past. Tell us about, about when you were an infant and what happened to you. Well, it started off when I was just, uh, before I was born, it was a little girl walking home from school and uh, just Bible school there in uh, down near Miami and the, her father which was a Baptist preacher there in uh, Manny, North Carolina they all, all died and she was living with her older sisters and she came to live down in Miami with her twin sister and when she was walking away from church he invited her to take a ride home instead of taking her all the way home they stopped at one of his homes and when he was taken through reluctantly she had uh, looked at his property, et cetera, and he, when they went to the bedroom, he shut, slammed the door, and that's when he uh, violated her as a 13-year-old girl. Uh, she didn't recognize she was pregnant too much later, and her, her twin sister looked at her and said, you're pregnant, Cherry. And when she looked at the circumstances, she told her older sister, and her sister said, you know, you, we can't keep this child in here. It's impossible. We cannot keep another baby. We're barely taking care of you. We don't have no food hardly to feed you two, but they came at a later state in the game. And so something happened down there that they had to move further up part of uh, Florida to Plant City. You know, God always has his hands in it. And she ended up having to go down to the near abortion clinic on her advice of her family. And while she was going there, she heard a voice that said, you know, if you let this baby live, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of the child. And hearing that voice, she, she turned around and she went back home. And when she got back home, uh, Sister asked her, you know, what happened? You know, did you get the abortion? And she said, no, so I'm going to trust God. And she put up trust in God, Dr. Lewis. And she went to the hospital and she told the doctor, she said, listen, I can't keep this baby because my sister said we're too poor. But if you know somebody, if you can find anybody, who can take care of a child, a Christian person, preferably. He said, I will. And the doctor didn't want to get involved, but something impressed him to call a lady that used to bring little kids because she was a foster care lady in the area. And she called Annette Brown. She said, you know, would y'all come and look at this child we got in the, before we put him in the system, would you come and look at this baby? And they did. They came down to the hospital and my birth mother had already left me there. And then they named me Moses. They said, we got you out of the bulrushes. Oh. So here I am living how, this life. How precious is that? You know, there's so many, so many aspects of this that we can kind of chew on. Let me go back for a second, though. So your birth mother was 13 years old and raped by, was it, did you say an elder in the church? He was a, a Baptist. They were, she was going to... The, the evening service that they have, he was one of the deacons. A deacon. And uh, he was taking her home. And uh, in that, because it was hot, it was in August. And uh, down in South Florida, it get very hot. But uh, through that incident, it was truly a mess. But God had took his hand and made a miracle out of it. Yes, yes. We praise God for that and for the fact that she listened to the voice of God, and she was obedient to what the Lord told her to do. So, oh, yeah. 
She was 13 years old and she had this traumatic experience. Do you know now in retrospect and hearing the story, do you know if the deacon was ever, um, were the charges were ever pressed against him or anything like that? Sometimes back in those days, a lot of things kind of went over. He was not only a deacon, but he was a, a, one of the first African-American police officers down there. And they was tied in all these little gangs and well, more than gangs, it was a lot of things. That's what uh, the family she was living, my mother was living with, had to move suddenly because the person, they kind of knew each other all around there. And uh, I went down to look for him when I, I was going to Farsak Academy and we was traveling down to, uh, to do a concert there. And my mother said, you know, this is, when she told me the story, my birth mother, I was, I was, that was another story in itself, because when I had to get to know I was adopted. But she told me the story, she said his name, and, and we went down through the quarters of, of the phone book and calling all the last names start with Scott. And I came across somebody who said, well, if you're looking for that name, uh, Vernon Scott said they had his funeral two weeks ago. Mm. So God blocked it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes God does something to what we think what we should be doing, and it's, it would alter because he sees the future. And I believe it, most likely, if I had got into knowing him, there's something about knowing the Father, whatever he had done due to the fact I was his child, uh, God maybe foreseeing something would have altered my course to what he had already planned. Yes, yes, and that, I think that's a very good way to look at it. So let's back up now. So, so someone, your birth mother gave birth to you and the doctor called in a Mrs. Brown to look at you. Mrs. Brown had foster children and he called her in to take a look at this newborn baby. What happened from there? Well, when I got to the hospital, she, she um, and my sister and my dad, his name was Leroy Brown, not all names. <laughs> <laughs> Judge and, uh, Leroy Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and they, 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 took, they took a look at it and said, you know, yes, we're going to train this child to be up for the Lord. We're going to navigate his path. Uh, said, we don't know how we're going to do it, but because they never had a baby in the home. They had adopted two kids from the Adventist uh, orphanage there in Korea. And uh, they were seven and eight years old. Then we all, she also had... An, young lady that she had somebody dropped off her, at her door years before and she was about grown by the time I got there so she took me in and just she gave me the names that would fit just in case I try to venture off and uh, Moses <laughs> Samuel she went to Samuel too as a middle name Brown she was making sure she gave you some <laughs> biblical names <laughs> she didn't play <laughs> She loved the Lord. She started the church there in the uh, Plant City area, one of the first churches amongst the churches that had started in the South Atlantic Conference during that time. And, uh, but she engraved and, and installed in me, said, you can be better than what you think you, you are. And she always said this little cliche, you know, every man put their pants on the same way. Get up and do something. And she kept us very busy and going to church, uh, during the end gathering, we was always out there. She taught us how to play. She couldn't play a piano herself, but she put a piano and organ in the church. She knew how. She knew the notes, and we learned how to play. She just kept it going because she wanted to serve God through all the means that she had. What a beautiful, what a beautiful testimonial, related as related to your mom. I mean, what a wonderful person she was. She had such love. She had. It sounds like she had such love. She took children and gave them, she trained them up in the way that they should go. Yes, yes. And, and they, gave you a work ethic and a desire to serve the Lord. And that's an incredible, incredible legacy that she left. Uh, so how did you find out that you were adopted? Lord, that was somewhat complicated. Um, after not knowing I was adopted, then having to find out that I was adopted, it caused some, some anguish because I thought that the mother and father that I had there, Leroy and Annette Brown, were my birth parents. 
until I turned about 14 or so myself. And because I looked kind of like my dad, and they were brown, and I was the only one looking like him. I kind of thought, I said, well, you know, this is, this is what it is. But then we discovered one day my mother fessed up and said, you know, um, your, your birth mother is named Cherry Rogers. And uh, that took me for a loop. That, that I had to kind of re-identify myself, who I was, or what I was, or what I was going to even be. It was uh, uh, an experience that I had to go back and pray. And you know, the devil was start saying, you know, you're a bastard child anyway. You don't belong here. You know, you ought to just take your life. God can't have no plan for you. Uh, how could God have something for you if you weren't even meant to be here? So you know, I Satan try to torment you. Yes. But I had to go back to the Word and to that that uh, Proverbs. In all your ways acknowledge me. He said, I'll direct your path. Trust yes. in the Lord with all your heart and lean out upon your own. And so I had to back off my own understanding and put it in God's hands. And God whispered in my ear. He said, I am with you. He said, I will never leave you, never forsake you. The circumstances under which you have placed yourself in or you in, he said, I've been there all along with you. And so I had to trust that God had a plan bigger than what I knew. And when I found out that God was in it, I backed off and let God handle it. Amen. And that's, that's what it's all about, letting God, letting go and letting God, just yes. letting Him handle it. The amazing thing, again, you've given a lot of little elements here that we could chew on. The amazing thing is that God did have a plan for you and He navigated this whole deal, you know, he, he, the, the situation that took place was so traumatic, I'm sure, for your birth mother. And yet God had a plan for you and just brought you through, gave you to wonderful parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, your life could have been so different, but he gave you to wonderful parents and then they brought you up to know and fear God. And that's just, that's such a wonderful blessing. God had that plan for you, Pastor Brown. Yes, yes. All I, from the very beginning, He had a plan for you. And that's the God that we serve, a loving God that can take a really traumatic situation and turn it into a blessing. Amen. It's an Amen. amazing I, thing. I, I go through that, Dr. Lewis, and I, I wake up with a different attitude because I realize that it was God's purpose for me to be here. When I go back to so many places where so many kids have been uh, let go. I say, God, you gave me a chance. And with all the circumstances under which I did come into the world, you know, society indicates that those are the circumstances that I should not be here. But God interfered and he intervened and he, he, he kind of navigated that whole program to work out the way he wanted to be. So I can't do nothing but give God glory just to be alive today. Amen. Amen. So when you found out that you were adopted, it was kind of earth shattering for you at first because mm -hmm. it kind of um, undermined your foundation in a sense. So how did you get it back? How did you begin to accept what had happened? Well, I went back and looked at all the things that my mother had done for me and my parents. They had, she, she surely tried. She gave everything. You know, we had Bible studies and we went to uh, church often, more often than most people did. Uh, she tried to send me to to good schools and try to do all those things. And that, it, it kind of brought me back to see that what she meant was for my good. Mm. And technically she was my mother because she had me at, she took me from birth. And from that point, and it was hard to identify anything else because I was her son. That's right. And she gave me the name. But I guess in the, her plan was in the course of getting older, I probably would find out. So she, she went on and told me, and I kind of knew who my other people were. And those connecting, connections started building. Then I met my birth mother, 
and relatives. And my birth mother told me the story because I had to ask my birth mother, why did you let me go? Because she had three other children after me. Mm. She was trying to find security in our life. She was just a teenager and she found an older, older guy that took her in and moved up to Rochester, New York. And uh, that's why I went up there to meet her when I was at Forest Lake about the age of 14. And they told me that, uh, she said, I had to let you go because in this situation, you would most likely, by the man I married, would have done killed you by now, but knowing that you're not his child and the way he treated his own children. And she said, she just gave me the story how she had to live with the fact, living all that pressure to whether have me or not have me. But she told me, and that's why I knew faith in God pays off. She said, my faith in God was he was going to take care of you because God promised her as a child. They said, I'll take care of that child. Wow, that is so deep. So what did you leave, when you, when you went to meet your mother, your birth mother, what were you expecting? And when you walked away from that meeting, what had you received? It's something about bonding. You know, whichever way you go, you, you, try, to, you try to bond with the original. And th this was the person that brought me into the world. Uh, I was just gazing at her, looking at her, uh, trying to see those familiar uh, places on her body that kind of look like mine, that my face looked like hers or something, and just see her, her personality, et cetera. And then for her to give me the, the history, you know, what happened, what was going on, and then having to ask her, why didn't you keep me? And so that, that caused a little frustration as a teenager. I was somewhat indignant. You know, why did you just let me go and you kept these other three? You could have kept me too. And I didn't really understand, Dr. Lewis, the, the, all the connections to how I really was in existence right now. But I realized that it was nothing but the hands of God. And she had to explain to me, she said, I could not keep you. And she said, it was for your own, your better good. And she said, I did not abort you either. She said, I gave you a chance to live. And she said, I didn't know how you were going to turn out, what was going to turn out, or who even had you. She said, even after years later, she went looking for me. But she said, she didn't, she didn't know what was going on, but she knew that God was taking care of me. And I had to come to the realization that it's in God's hand. And he was navigating this path. It wasn't nobody's, nobody's else, nobody else's hand. Because God put me in a Seventh-day Adventist home. There was many other homes or people could have been called. God started me off as a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm glad he did. Yes. I'm so glad he did. I don't know what I would have been up, uh, and I wouldn't be on your show probably if I <laughs> ended up somewhere else. <laughs> well, we praise the Lord. We just praise the Lord for, for what he's done in your life and how his hand has always been on you. He's never left you for a moment. And we just praise the Lord for that. So after you met her and after you left, how did that affect your relationship with your adopted mother, your adoptive mother? My adopted mother was a strong lady. She was, um, oh, she was an entrepreneur and a businesswoman herself. And she, she kind of, I guess she had known in her heart that something like this would kind of take place. But she would always, say, she said, you know, you, you know what the reality is. So that you can make your bed hard, but you're going to sleep on it. She had all the cliches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can go your route. You can even leave home. It's up to you, you know. Uh, she said, but this is what I have to offer you. I offer you Jesus Christ. And that was the strongest thing that she gave me, that love that said, you, you can have this life here with me. She said, I promise you I'll give you all the mothering. She did. She gave me all the love that I could even imagine. And with that love, I, I have installed it, and she has never left my heart. And she realized that uh, her, her love for me was not predicated on the love that my birth mother had. And I, I knew that it was just genuine, of what it was, where it was, and nothing could substitute the love of my adopted mother. That is so beautiful. Now. You're speaking of her in the past tense. Is she resting in Jesus now? She's resting in Christ Jesus. She died in 1991. Uh, she adopted me when she was in her late 50s. So it was, it was uh, a lot of gossip around the community, you know. Who's this baby this lady got that 
you know, did a husband go out and have one, but one of the children go go out of town and bring up child back. You know, all this stuff was. Yeah. But uh, she adopted me in her late 50s, and uh, she died in 1991. And uh, my dad had died before him. And then also my birth mother, she died before even my, she died when she was about 40 some years old. Mm. So they all kind of passed away. But they had just not too long ago, they wrote a story on her just two years ago on the front page of the Tampa Tribune. And it said, Mother Brown. And they told her story. So even after she's gone, the, the legacy she has left here has just transcended year to year to decades. That's, oh, that's wonderful. That is so wonderful. And what a tribute you are to her. Um, that is just a beautiful thing. So let, let's go now from that part of your journey to where you are now. What are you doing now? Um, I guess I could, if I'd say everything, you'd think I'm cloned. <laughs> 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 well, I'm trying to trying to stay in one place. I work with the Adventist Health Systems in the, in the ministry that is so uh, drawing to to my heart, which is working in chaplaincy. They've just got six hospitals down here at the Adventist Florida Hospital, working in that air capacity, do that part time. Uh, then I run Feed Our Children Ministries. <clears throat> Feed Our Children Ministries is a ministry I started 20 some years ago, seeing the children who were just left abandoned, hungry, starving because of the drug academic that had taken place in the communities. In urban areas, there was drugs, cocaine, crack cocaine, everything you can imagine. And that inadvertently caused an effect on the children because when I went to one of the communities where the children had saw a shooting in the parking lot, the police department asked me would I come down and talk to the community. So I started talking to kids and we bring out snacks. When I brought out the snacks, I asked one of the kids, what would you like to have? And he said, well, I'd like to have a Thanksgiving meal like they have on television. I thought he was just kidding with me, but I realized after talking with him, he said the only thing he had for, for Thanksgiving was a hot dog and some chips and et cetera, because his mother had sold everything for the crack. And when that took place, it was very difficult for him to even imagine what it was like to have a Thanksgiving dinner. And so I told him, I said, well, you know, I knew I was on the radio doing some commentaries during that time. I said, I'll get on the radio. I asked the community to come out. And I said, you get your friends and you bring your friends out and I, we'll see what happens. But I don't want you to go through another Thanksgiving without having that feeling of family connection. So he had gotten approximately 400 friends from the community. And I brought out a food that I thought was gonna just feed about a uh, 100. But Dr. Lewis, I tell you, God worked a miracle that day. I mean, I read about the fish and the loaves of bread, but it took place again right here in the Tampa Bay area. Because the people of the community was looking and said, how are you gonna feed that many people with such a little bit of food? But we had no notion that he would bring that many people out. But I told him, I say, the God I serve, He'll make a way out of nowhere. Come on. Come on now. And the media camera was out there. And they wanted to see, you know, sometimes the media love to see action. And they were, yeah. you know, that, that would have been a big story. But I said, there would be no blasphemy come against God's name. Come on. He is the one that told me to do it. He, what God guides, God will provide. And I just let, let it go. And you have all those negative Im images around you that keep saying, Man, you made all the stop it. Just call it off. I said, no, the God told me to do this. And he will, he is his, it is his job to make this thing come to fruition. And at the end, when the cameras was out there, they saw that that little bit of food, people had, you know how we are sometimes, we, we bring our foil and uh, our, our little Tupperware, they, they brought their foil and Tupperware and had food left over. Come on now, preacher. That's my God. Come on now. So look at God, look, he, just, just like when Christ fed the multitude, God stretched the food. He stretched the food. That's what we say on, you know, when people come over on Sabbath and you don't think you have enough. Oh, Lord, please stretch the food. I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> that is, look at God. Look at how he did that. And look at the faith. He honors your faith. 
you had faith. You knew that if God told you to do it, he was going to make a way for it to happen. And he did. Yes, he did. And, and knowing, you know, once you start reading Christ's word, it, it shows you over and over that he's a God of his word. He'll never lie. And when he say he'll never leave you and never forsake you, I know that's, that's true in every aspect. I have learned to pray the promises in the Bible. And by praying the prom promises, God always has to answer those prayers. And so I pray with authority that he's given me that this will come to fruition when I'm doing his will. Yes. When I know that I'm doing his will, I have nothing to fear but fear itself. So I trust God all the way. And so we made, we called, we started a ministry called Feed Our Children. We're on the website, feedourchildren.org. And in there, we have the, we deliver food to the people that need. So I wanted something that can cut out the red tape. Cause I see a lot of people going down, trying to get food who are hungry and needy. I said, God didn't have no red tape, nobody in line. He just told the disciples, go out and spread the food out. And so I cut out the red tape. I said, when they call us, that means they need it. So we have volunteers all over who would take the food to needy families, elderly people who feel like they got to pay they, their medical bills and try to take their grandkids with their children, parents inside the jail. You know, that's, that can get very difficult. And so we have taken it to so just call us and we'll open the door for you and we'll make sure that we do the will of God. We put, we put in those bags a track, Steps to Christ, and uh, Bible reading for the home, things that they can find Christ Jesus. And we're hoping that when we walk down those streets of gold, Dr. Lewis, they'll run up and say, you know, that bag that you gave me with food, not only was food for feed my, my physical body, but it fed my soul. Yes, yes, praise the Lord. How beautiful is that? So you're feeding, you're, you're addressing the, the physiological issues and the spiritual issues and emotional because those are, that's an act of love, Pastor, doing that, giving someone food that's hungry, that's yes. an act of love. We praise the Lord for your ministry. What would you like to leave with our viewers? If you had 30 seconds to tell our viewers something, what would you leave them with about your ministry? Well, feed our children that has been a part of it and we can always been there trying to help people. They can go to our website and just uh, feedourchildren.org. They'll find us there, they wanna contribute. They're welcome. Uh, and also keep me in prayer. I need prayer. I preach all over the country and been in Kenya and, and we have it off. I was with Obama's grandmama uh, last year. They had it in the paper and met her and we helping her orphanages over there. So God is working with us. But when I travel around, I'm preaching the gospel, trying to save souls around the world and also doing a lot of crusades here in the United States. So keep me in your prayer. Thank you so much, Pastor Brown. And our viewers might not know, but you also sing, and you're going to be on our program, Magnify Him, coming up soon. Oh, so I'm this is a man of that. many gifts right here. Right here, God <laughs> has you blessed so you. Thank you so much. May God continue to richly bless you. And thank you so much for tuning in. Tune in next time. Just wouldn't be the same without you.